Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, nice to see you. We're going to do our announcements to begin our time today, and then we'll do our call, call to worship. I wanted to let everyone know that next Sunday is going to be our graduation Sunday for our four graduates who are a part of our church. So I encourage everyone to be here to encourage them. And I think everyone, all of our graduates know, but we're going to get a picture of you between our worship service and Sunday school so that we can have that available for our church family next Sunday. So thanks for that. Thank you also, church family, for participating in giving for our missionary care boxes. So that was sent out this week, and I'm sure that our missionaries in Ninana will be blessed. We'll try to do that three to four times a year, so we've uh, got a couple of, a few weeks before we'll start to think about that again. Also, I wanted to remind everybody of what's going on on Sunday nights right now. This Sunday night will be our third week in going through a series, a video series from Ligonier Ministries on Union with Christ. So if you haven't been the last couple Sunday nights, I would encourage you, you can still come and catch it tonight, uh, just watching these videos by Sinclair Ferguson, who is one of the best at really expressing what it means that we are united to Jesus. Uh, I also would encourage you, we will not finish that series. It's a multi-video series, but hopefully this will whet your appetite a little bit. And for $20, you can get the whole series from Ligonier, and it would be highly recommended. But then next Sunday, there will be nothing in the evening time because of fellowship dinner. That's fellowship dinner Sunday. But the next Sunday after that, we will begin our home groups. Uh, there will be one in our house and then one uh, that Jonathan Peters will be leading. And we don't have a home for that yet. I know one family has expressed that they would be interested. But uh, if you as a family, as a, a family home would be interested in hosting that, the first Sunday nights and third Sunday nights of each month, please see me today so that we can get that settled. And then next week we will have our information as to what those home groups are going to be. But uh, as we went through this last round of home groups, it was really, really valuable for us uh, just being together, sharing our lives together uh, in both or in all three of the different home groups. So we're looking forward to this next round. Uh, I want to remind everybody who has smaller kids, we do have our kids coloring packets uh, outside in the lobby, so make sure that you grab those. Also, out in the lobby are our elements for communion. So if you've not gotten those, uh, you can grab those sometime during the service or after we do our last song before communion, but I would just encourage you to go out the side aisles here since we've got our camera here and then we'll be doing, doing communion. So thanks for, for being patient with that. We're tr still trying to be wise in our decision making. Uh, we have a deacons meeting coming up. It's usually the first Sunday or the first Tuesday in each month, but it kind of snuck up on us. Can you believe April is gone? So uh, I would like to recommend to our deacons that we do it the second Tuesday. That way a couple of our deacons will be back. So that will be the, the, the 11th. If you have an issue with that, just catch me today and we can adjust a little bit. And as I mentioned, the fellowship dinner is next Sunday. So I hope everyone can participate in that. Information is in the bulletin as far as what the theme is going to be. So uh, looking forward to that. And then one more thing before we have our call to worship. We are coming to the time when a lot of our families will be gone for the summer, both in Igigik and, and not just our fishermen. We've got a lot of our teenagers who are going to be down there this summer, and then also Whittier with Perry and Lois, and then people going different directions. So this Sunday, today in Sunday school, is going to be our last curriculum Sunday as far as our walk through the New Testament. Great place to end as we'll be in the resurrection. Next Sunday, we will have a review like we have done several times with all of our Sunday school classes in the fellowship room. Michael has some things planned as far as quizzes and games and things like that. So it'll be kind of a, a wrap up to our Sunday school curriculum next Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, we will begin our Sunday school curriculum with different goings on as far as our teachers because of our uh, teachers not being here for the summer. So uh, two Sundays from now, we will begin new curriculum on parables. So we're looking forward to that. All right. I believe that is it for the, prayer, for the announcements. We'll do some prayer requests in a little bit, but let me invite our worship team to come on up. And you, church family, please stand with me 
and I will give you our call to worship. It is out of Psalm 147, and it's verses 1 and 3. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Wounds, And it is those arms that heal and support and take care of and bind upon which we lean. So let's sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy to find. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, leaning. Safe and secure. Secure from all alarms. Please remain standing. We are going to have our scripture reading out of Psalm 3 before we continue to sing together. Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on all people. Selah. Amen. Those are the arms upon which we lean, the one who cares for his children more than you and I could ever comprehend. Let's continue to sing about our great God with this song, O Great God.
please be seated. We will have our time of prayer now. <clears throat> Lots of prayer requests right now. Before I mention all of the ones for which we need to be praying, I do want to thank you for your generosity and kindness and love to our missionary, John Hutchison, as he was with us last week, the love offering you gave, the ways that you cared for him. Uh, he has already emailed me and let me know that he appreciates you and that. Uh, he's been up in Big Lake this last week, and he's preaching at, uh, is it Big Lake Bible Fellowship Bible Church in Big Lake? Something, I think some of you are familiar with that church, and so he will be headed back down to South Carolina probably tomorrow, but uh, and then he also had some meetings in Anchorage uh, with some other churches so that when he comes back in a few years, he isn't just coming to two or three churches. So continue to pray for Frontline, pray for all of our missionaries, and we're thankful for the ministry they are doing. While I'm saying that, I do want to mention, I try to mention this about once every few months, we have a lot of extra love offering, or not love offering, extra type offering things that are not a part of our budget. One of those is our benevolent fund, another is our building fund, and then also there is the Russian camps fund, which is in the little plexiglass church building that is out in the lobby. And uh, just every, every few months, we want to remind you that those are opportunities for you, as God lays on your heart, to be giving for extra things uh, in our church family as we are ministering. So I, I do want to remind you of those things just so that they're kind of on our radar. Let me give you our prayer requests. Dave Honeycutt is with us, but I guess he's going to be facing shoulder surgery sometime soon, so I'm, we're thankful that Dave is with us, grateful for him being a part of our lives. Continue to pray for Tom McCoy. He had a pr procedure this last Thursday and is doing well for that. The main thing that's keeping him from being able to be with us now is arthritis, and he's got treatments for them, but... Uh, he, uh, it's been a long, long process for him, and he's gaining a little bit of strength, so hopefully at some point he and Lee will be back with us. We want to pray for George Delano. Uh, just continue to lift him up in your prayers, and Barbara is here today, but uh, please be praying for him and all of his family, uh, just uh, in all the physical things he's dealing with. We want to continue to pray for Anna Lee Bach. She had to go back to the hospital this week and is still there in the ICU. Uh, but continue to lift her up in your prayers. And then Phil and Penny, they're doing well. They're having a great time, but we want to pray for them as they, at some point, I think they're, uh, Misty told me yesterday, they're headed up to the Creation Museum, which is in our part of the world where Ann and I come from, uh, soon, and then they'll be kind of thinking toward coming back, not sure where they're gonna, whether they're going to be able to get their RV through Canada, but we are looking forward to having them back with us but also grateful that they've had this time with their granddaughters. And then also we want to be praying for Ted uh, Allen with just some job needs, and uh, you can talk to him and ask him how those things are going, but we want to be praying for him and lifting him up. All right, probably a lot of other needs. Uh, you have your bulletins there that uh, have many of our other needs, but that's uh, a lot that are on our minds. So please join with me now in a spirit, a mindset of prayer as I kind of lead our church family to God. I thank you, Father, for... Uh, the fact that we can be here together, uh, your family, the body of Christ, all of those metaphors in the New Testament that talk about the glory of the fact that you have established in your purposes and in your sovereignty and providence every single person who is a part of our church family. So thank you for that. You are very generous and you are very kind and good. We also want to adore and praise you this morning for who you are and what you do. Your attributes are endless in their glory and their value. And just to think of a couple, I thank you, I praise you for the fact that you are patient with us. Uh, your, your children who so often make wrong decisions and do not reflect your character and do not love like you love and aren't as patient as you are and do not extend mercy to others the way you have extended mercy to us, yet you are infinitely patient with us and you will never stop holding us fast in your hands, Jesus and Father. So we, are, we want to praise you for that. We praise you for the fact that you shepherd us, that you through your word and through your spirit give us direction. When it seems like we're lost and we, we can't find our way and, and when our strength fails and when from a human perspective we have no hope, you are faithful 
and you will never forget the covenant you have made with us. You have entered into covenant with us, and so you will never stop shepherding us. And so we praise you for that aspect of your character. We praise you for the aspect of your character that uh, you're infinitely powerful. And so as we face all of the things of life, we have someone on our side who will never leave us or forsake us, who spoke the stars into existence and created this world and brings the seasons four times a year and makes the sun come up every day or the world revolving around it, I guess. Uh, but all of those things that demonstrate your power, you are on our side and you are for us. And with a good, kind, powerful, sovereign Father who is for us, we have nothing to fear. So we praise you for all of those things. And we praise you especially always for the great reality that you've sent your Son to live perfectly so that by faith His righteousness covers us, not by our own merit or value, not because you foresaw anything good in us, but only to the praise of your glorious grace. And we also praise you that not only did He live in our place, but He died in our place, suffering your wrath on our behalf so that we could be considered sons and daughters and never for an instant through all eternity bear one drop of your judgment, for He bore it all, that we might live and be blessed in the heavenly places and find our treasure of supreme and infinite value. And so we praise you for what you've done through your Son and His death on our place, in our place, we praise you for the fact that He did not stay dead, that He rose again, and His resurrection guarantees that His payment was enough and that we too will rise again, and you were satisfied with His payment, and death has been defeated. And so as we face sickness and uncertainty and ultimately our own physical deaths, the fact that Jesus right now has ascended and He's interceding on our behalf gives us great confidence that everything in the end, we'll be made right, and we will dwell with you forever with glorified bodies just like Jesus's. So we praise you especially for the gospel this morning. And not only do we worship you and adore you, we want to thank you for all of the physical ways that you show your kind, fatherly love to us. We thank you for seasons and the fact that uh, it's warmer and that... Uh, for the most part, the snow's melted and the sun's been shining and we get to enjoy long days of summer here in Alaska. We thank you that you have brought us together here in this church building today, uh, the body of Christ, with cars that work. We're grateful for that. We're grateful for technology, the fact that we can uh, put uh, the lyrics of our songs on the screen and we have Bible apps and we can broadcast our service on YouTube. We're just so grateful for all of those things that you have given in common grace to mankind. But we as your people want to make sure that we recognize that they are gifts from you. We praise you for our health. We thank you for our health, the fact that you uh, do take care of us in so many ways. And we're just very grateful for that and many, many things for which we could be thankful for. The song is very accurate when it talks about counting our blessings and we never, ever could finally get done enumerating them. And as we think about the fact that you do take care of us in so many ways, we want to we lift up our requests to you. I've mentioned several. I won't repeat those, but thank you that you are sovereign over them and you love these children of yours and you will demonstrate your care and your kindness and your miraculous power to heal uh, if it's your will in all of these. And I thank you that we can leave these in your hands knowing that you are wiser than we are and you have the power to heal. So we pray that if it's your will, you will do these in the circumstances. Of th just think of a couple, uh, Anna Lee, especially uh, my mother-in-law, who I didn't mention, who is going through cancer treatments, and just all of these. I just pray for all of them. We also want to pray for our country, that you will show mercy to it with all of the political and racial unrest and uncertainty that's going on. We thank you that ultimately our hope was never in Donald Trump. It's not in Joe Biden. It's not in the one who will replace him, Jesus, if you tarry. Uh, it is in you, and that is far transcendent of the things that we experience in the political sphere. So that causes us to be able to let go of those things and not have anxiety and rest in you. So thank you that you are our king, and that really matters. And we pray for our world. I think of uh, all of the Christians who are undergoing 
way worse treatment than we are undergoing in the United States right now. Nigeria, North Korea, Iran, China, some of those places where it's illegal to even meet together with other Christians. I pray for them. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I lift them up to you right now. And I pray for our world and just all of the different things that are on the radar right now. I thank you that we can again come together today. May the meditations of our heart and what comes out of our hearts and the words that we sing, may the exposition of your scripture that I hope will be faithful to it and to you in a few moments, may all of these things bring glory to you and satisfaction to our hearts as we renounce all of the things in which we would try to find satisfaction, those empty cisterns that will never satisfy and drink from the fountain of living waters who will always satisfy and that will glorify you. So that really is great. And all these things we give to you thankfully in your son's saving and precious name. Amen. Let's sing one more song together before we open God's word. So as I typically do on Sundays, I will ask you to stand one more time, uh, even though we'll be standing for the reading of the Word of God in a few minutes. So let's stand together and we will sing a song that I know is dear to many of you with some of the things that you're experiencing right now even. He will hold me fast. Please be seated. You can uh, grab your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 4. We will stand in just a minute one more time to honor God's Word together, but you can turn to Matthew 4. We're going to be in verses 12 through 25 in just a moment. Praise God again for the fact that He has given us the capacity to have God, His Word, His revelation to mankind about how to be reconciled to Him in our hands. 
whether that's on your phone or your iPad or a copy of the Bible that you brought or even the Pew Bible and uh, even what you've put in your heart. So with that in mind, as a physical demonstration of how kind and gracious He has been to us in giving us His Word, let's honor Him by standing together. And you follow along as I read Matthew 4, 12 through 25. Matthew 4, 12 through 25. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Please be seated and let's pray together. I ask, Father, for your Spirit to give me utterance and wisdom and power, not because of anything in me, not because of my own acumen or intelligence or eloquence, but only because of your powerful, life-giving Word and your Spirit who dwells in us and who has also inspired these words and uses them to speak to hearts of both the unregenerate and the regenerate and His, your Spirit who dwells in the hearts of every believer here. So it just amazes me that the power to change hearts is readily available, again, not due to the speaker, but due to you. So I claim that this morning. In your Son's name, amen. I believe that I don't have any proof for this from Scripture, but it has to be that after Adam and Eve sinned and experienced the curse, there had to have been a little bit of them as they faced the out-of-control snowball that started when they said yes to sin. They had to have thought, oh, I wish it could be like it was before. I think God has baked that into the human experience. And even though John 3 says that men love darkness rather than light, there's a sense in them, even when they oppress it, and Romans 1 talks about exchanging the glory of God for all of these other things, there's something in mankind, even the unregenerate, that thinks to themselves, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. That's why you have movies about superheroes. That's why you have movies and, and literature about a person or, or a circumstance who comes to make things right. It's part of who we are. And especially those of us who have the first fruits of the Spirit, who know where God is going with all of this, when we experience heartache and separation and, and sickness and death and discord, we can't help but thinking, this isn't the way 
it's supposed to be. But I have good news. The king has come. And he has established his kingdom, and he will finalize it one day, and we are participants in it. That's the theme we have come up with for the whole book of Matthew. And these first verses of Jesus' public ministry, he's already been baptized, he's already been tempted by Satan, but now he is establishing his ministry as far as an initial public offering, right? Going public with his kingdom. The beginning of Jesus' ministry pictures the establishment of His kingdom. And what He's going to do through all of Matthew, what we experience as His children, His sons and daughters who live in His kingdom now, and then what He will do when He puts an exclamation point on it and makes all things new, the echoes of that or the anticipations of that, the pictures of it go on right here as he hits the ground running with his public ministry. So Jesus announces and begins the elements of the establishment of his kingdom, calling people out of darkness into light. And just think about how these apply to you as a follower, as a disciple, as one who treasures Jesus, as one who's united with Christ. Calling people out of darkness into light, choosing those who will follow him, confirming the reversal of the curse in His healing. First of all, in verses 12 through 16, He brings people from darkness to light. Verses 12 and 13 actually pick up some time later than verse 11. We were in verse 11 two weeks ago, the section where Jesus is tempted by Satan and it's sometime later than that because we know that John was put in prison a little bit later. So Jesus hearing that John was arrested and withdrawing into Galilee, really what it's doing is it's skipping over the first year of his three-year ministry. That's called by theologians the year of obscurity. And then the second year is his year of popularity. And then his third year is the year of opposition. Okay, so first year, year of obscurity, kind of skipped from verse 11 to verse 12. So now he's going to begin his second year, his year of popularity. That year of obscurity, the only place you can find that in Scripture is in John 1 through 4. That's when he is doing miracles, doing signs, but it's more localized. It's not kind of so all Israel can see. That's actually when he meets... Originally, the disciples that he's going to call in a few verses. So this is right at the beginning of his more public ministry. He's going to be doing miracles. Opposition is going to be growing. We're going to find that through all of Matthew. And then as, we, as, as it's talking about John here in verse, 12, in verse 12, John's ministry as the forerunner, as the bridge between the Old Covenant and the one who has come to establish his kingdom, his purpose is over and he will soon be beheaded at the whim of of a puppet king who likes his stepdaughter's dancing. Now, Galilee, where he is here, that was in the northwestern part of Israel, close to the Sea of, as you would surmise, Galilee. And as verse 13 says, Nazareth and Capernaum, two little towns that were in Galilee, uh, Capernaum especially, where Jesus' ministry is going to be centered, especially during this time, it was a small town on the northern shore where he lived. Okay, so that's kind of where he sets up his home base. Then the Old Testament territories of Zebulun and Naphtali, right? Two of the absolute most popular of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's kind of in that northwestern part of Israel. And this is going to be the geographical center of much of his ministry, though obviously he's going to make trips to Judea, the southern part of Israel, and obviously Jerusalem. But in verses 14 through 16, Matthew is concerned especially with what this is saying about God's redemptive purposes, and that's why he quotes from Isaiah chapter 9. You remember in John chapter 8, verse 12, it's the Feast of Booths, and Jesus says this amazing statement that He's the light of the world, and that would be at the time during the Feast of Booths in the fall of the year where all of these 
lights are lit around the temple in Jerusalem. And what he's saying is this, just as this light kind of uh, encircles all of its surrounding area from the place where God meets with His people, that's who I am. I'm the one who shines into the darkness of individuals and peoples. Just like 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And this is what Matthew is emphasizing as he reveals the fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah, specifically verses, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. This is what verse 15 says here that's quoting Isaiah 9. The land of Zebulun, the, the land of Naphtali, the way by the sea, so kind of Sea of Galilee, but then even, you know, like the, the Mediterranean Sea is, is kind of in that general direction to the west, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. A lot of Gentiles in, the area, in that area because that's the area that the Assyrians conquered and then the Babylonians conquered as they were coming south to capture Jerusalem. The Assyrians didn't capture Jerusalem, but they took that northern part of Israel, so a lot of Gentiles even living in that area. Verse 16, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. So here's the quote. And for those dwelling in the region of the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. In Isaiah chapter 9, God promised to deliver His people. So this was written about in the 750s B.C. And through Isaiah, God is promising His people who will go into exile that He will eventually deliver them through a child who is to be born. Chapter 6 of Isaiah 9 has, has the verse that we are more familiar with during Christmas time. So God had promised in Isaiah 9 that He's going to deliver them through this child who's to be born. And this was given to Jews living in Galilee, in the darkness among the nations. And as I said, these were the areas that would have in 722 as Assyria comes and conquers, and then in 605 and 586 as Babylon conquers, these were the areas that would have been trampled by those invading Assyrian and Babylonian armies. So they would have seen darkness. They would have seen horror. They would have seen what it means to be oppressed. But the Messiah, the light of the world, would begin His mission of saving and establishing God's kingdom here. This is fascinating, brothers and sisters, because that region of Galilee is a long way from Nikiski. Yet somehow the light has shone. What's the evidence of that? The evidence of that is the fact that you have had the light shine into your hearts. So I want you to picture this idea that in this locale, which was oppressed, where there's darkness, where Gentiles have overrun this area, where there's no hope, the light starts shining. And it has gone, not yet quite finally to the ends of the earth, where all peoples see and hear, but it's gone to us. And this is what Jesus does to those He includes in His kingdom. 1 Peter 2.9 describes this perfectly, that we have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. The darkness is all-encompassing. Maybe some of you don't remember how all-encompassing that darkness is because you were saved as young people. But you're probably reminded because you know how your flesh still battles against your spirit. But maybe someone who was saved later, or all you got to do is look at culture. The darkness is all-encompassing. There's slavery to sin. There's hostility to God. There's inability. There's hatred of God. There's no hope. There's this labyrinth of the soul that you can't escape. But maybe some of you remember when the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ did shine into your hearts and darkness was obliterated 
And so just as the darkness is all-encompassing by the power of the Spirit of God, the light is all-encompassing. And now we walk in the light as those who have been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once we weren't a people, but now we are a people. And this is what it means for Jesus to come and those who were in darkness have the light of the glory of God shine in their hearts. Do we value the enormous reality that only by God's mercy you are a participant in the kingdom of the light of God's Son. And this is what He does. And this is what it means to be a part of His kingdom. You've been transferred from darkness to light. And it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway, that if we have been transferred from darkness to light, the decisions we make, the words we say, what we choose how we live our lives, what we value, which category should we be drawing from? We're children of light. And then also, we have a chance to replicate this. For the whole reality here is that Jesus is coming into a place that's metaphorically demonstrated as darkness, and the light shines, and the darkness can't overcome it, just like John says in John 3. That's the same reality that compels our evangelism. As there are still dark places and hearts in the world. In Uzbekistan, in China, in North Korea, in Iran, in Nigeria. But also in Nikiski. You think there are still some dark hearts right next to you? That drive through our parking lot? That drive by our church building? That come to the compass throughout the week that you see at m m that you play sports with, that you work with, dark hearts where light can be illuminated into who they are because of the fact that we've experienced the light. Oh, what a great compulsion for evangelism. If you have experienced the great realities of what it means to now no longer walk in darkness but walk in light, what an overflow it can be for you to point the light of the glory of God in the face of Christ to others. Secondly, in verse 17, this, ex this is experienced by those who repent. Jesus' call in verse 17 to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand is the call to leave the darkness because the light has dawned. The entrance to Jesus' kingdom of light is repentance, which accompanies faith. And so Jesus is really repeating what John has already said during his baptism when he's saying, you must repent. And this repentance is someone saying, I have nothing to offer God. I want to say that again, because I think so often we think that the merit of our righteousness, our standing before God, was because there was just a little bit of righteousness that we had. Or God saw something in us. Or we can contribute something. Repentance is someone saying, I have nothing to offer God. And I deserve His wrath. And I wholly trust in Jesus alone. Not any of my so-called righteousness, which isn't righteousness at all, to forgive me for my sins and make me right with God. And I want to tell you, and so this is a gospel call, if you have not repented of anything you can contribute to being made right with God, my call to you today would be to finally let go of what you think you can offer God and repent of your self-righteousness. And then also included in that is repent of your sin. And put your faith wholly in the only one who can make you right with God, Jesus, who lived and died and rose again so that sinners by a repentant faith can be justified and called sons and daughters and live in the light. I say this often, and I, want, I just want to challenge you today. What today would be keeping you from that sort of repentant faith? It's not worth it. There will be many people who will spend eternity in hell under God's wrath because there was something they would not let go of, and quite often it is a self-righteousness. 
And so we as sons and daughters who participate in what it means to be in Jesus' kingdom, the only way to get into that kingdom, Jesus says, is by repentance, and then included from the rest of Scripture, we know it's a repentant faith alone. Then in verses 18 through 22, He calls followers who will see His value, abandon everything else, and engage in His mission. I, I, I was humming, I will make you fishers of men a lot this week. And I, and I love the fact that this passage is so integral, integrally tied to who we are as a church, right? You know, a lot of our church members make their livelihood by, I don't think there were salmon in the Sea of Galilee, but by doing exactly what uh, Peter and James and Andrew and John did. So what happens with these four men in verses 18 through 22? It pictures repentance. What do these guys do? They, they leave the things to which they could hold that they thought would give them value or livelihood or whatever else. They leave those things. They repent and turn toward Christ, abandoning anything they could hold on to. And this is in light of what Matthew has already said. So I'm going to give you kind of a, a brief summary of where we've already been in Matthew. Jesus is the Savior. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of David, the Son of Abraham. He's fully divine and fully human. He's King of the nations. He inaugurates a new exodus. He ends the mournful exile. He's filled with the Spirit. He's loved by the Father. He's the new Adam. And He's the true Israel. And already in this passage, He's the light of the world. And I guarantee you, if the Spirit gives you a realization of those things, nets and boats and dads and anything else are going to be counted as insignificant. And it is my prayer, not through my own, as I have said a couple of times already, my own eloquence, but by the power of the Spirit of God, that today, today, Maybe someone who's been a believer a long time would realize the valuelessness of all of these things that we think we've got to hold on to as the value of this one who's shown into the hearts of these four individuals would compel you to let go of all and follow Him. And I'm reminded of what John Hutchison was talking about last week. Maybe even an individual, a teenager, maybe even a, a you know, someone that's even older than I am, who would see the value of Jesus and see the value of His mission and His kingdom and abandon all, maybe even to go somewhere to serve for the sake of the gospel. We don't talk about that enough. And let us be ones who not because of some strong arm technique, but solely because of the shininess of the value of Jesus, be willing to forsake all and follow Him. In verse 18, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees two brothers, Simon, Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They're casting a net into the sea, and the verse says, for their fishermen. And his call in verse 19, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then a similar call to James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and they're mending their nets. In verse 21, it's the call to see his value. Abandon everything and engage in His mission. For I can tell you this, if you have been brought into the kingdom of light, it is a revolutionary 180 degree difference to what it means to be a part of the kingdom of darkness. And the one who shines, the, shines who is the light of that kingdom of light is infinitely compelling. You know, really, our own teaching and preaching and, and discipleship and everything so often boils down to just this. Do you comprehend the infinite value of Jesus? And does it compel you? It really comes down to that. Does it compel you to kill sin? Stop sending that, 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 that sin that so easily besets you. Does it compel you to reflect that love? Does it compel you to obey, to worship, to engage in mission? All of these other things. And does it compel you, as you've seen His value, to abandon everything else and engage in His mission? 
from verse 20, what did Peter and Andrew do? They leave their nets and they follow him. In verse 22, James and John immediately leave their boat and their father, Zebedee, and they follow him. Now, I know, obviously, later in some of the Gospels, they're back fishing. So, you know, it's kind of probably like Paul as far as, you know, his tent making. They had to make a living. But even after Jesus had died and risen and ascended, their mission, their job was to be His disciples, even if they were supported by continuing to fish. But the picture here is that they're abandoning it. It is no longer the thing they think of as most valuable. And this is what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. To see, as Paul said in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, that whatever gain you could have, you count as loss. I love this phrase. For the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. It surpasses everything. And this happens at conversion as you repent of any self-worth, trust, or works, and you abandon any other thing in which you could place your hope and fully trust in Jesus as your only hope for the forgiveness of sins and to be made right with God. But we find as children of God who are already regenerate, who have trusted Christ, that it's a continuing reality as we more and more see His worth and what it means to live in His kingdom and have Him as our King and as our treasure, we see the insignificance of all else. What's running through your mind right now? That if you have been exposed to the glories of Jesus like this, you will count as insignificant all the way up to your own life. And this is underneath the whole reality of the phrase with which we're familiar, fishers of men. We abandon all else. We follow Him, the one of infinite value, and we engage in the expansion of His kingdom, bringing more and more into the light out of darkness so that they too can become fishers of men as we let others know His value. I want to say this, and I hope that it, I hope that it convicts you because it's been convicting me as I've studied this. There's too often a rather nonchalant attitude toward the reality of following Jesus. It means to take up your cross. It means to lose everything to gain Him. It means to consider mother and father and brother and sister in every other relationship as hating in comparison to your love for Him. It means to suffer for the sake of the cross. In what way? I'll just ask it this way. What are we still holding on to? My prayer today for myself for you, for anybody who's watching, is, for, is again, for, for the glories of Jesus to shine so brightly in our affections that we look at this thing that we thought we really had to have, and it looks putrid in our eyes. And we will follow Him. And sometimes that following just means walking with Him daily as a fisherman or as a contractor or as whatever the things that we do. Or as a kid or as a spouse. But again, sometimes following Him might mean that as you have abandoned everything else, He takes you on a path for His glory that you never would have anticipated for the kingdom. Finally, in verses 23 through 25, He's comprehensively reversing the curse. Verses 23 through 25 five are an initiation, but they're also a preview. So it's initiating His ministry where He's healing, but it's a preview of what Jesus is doing to bring us back to God's original design and the eternal plan of redemption. God and man in relationship with no effects of sin. And it also pictures salvation. 
First in verse 23, Jesus goes through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. This is the good news that you can be brought out of darkness into light. And repentance will bring you into this kingdom. And you can find in Him a greater treasure that will compel you to abandon everything else. And it's all-encompassing, just like darkness was all-encompassing and light is all-encompassing. It's all-encompassing in the scope of all God has eternally been doing. Jesus is telling people that God is providing a way back to Him in forgiveness of sins through Him, the King and Savior. And the evidence of God inaugurating this kingdom of forgiveness and His righteousness reigning and sin being destroyed and the curse being reversed... And a great king is, Jesus in verse 23, healing every disease, every affliction among the people. That's the evidence. That's the evidence that there is this kingdom that the king has established. And he's a good king. And you can be made right with God and walk in light and have a greater treasure. The evidence of the fact that he's doing this is the fact that He's reversing the curse in every single one of these, or at least the effects of the curse in every single one of these people who can't see, can't walk, has a demon, and on and on and on. And His fame going all the way up into Syria. I stood actually at the border of Syria. wasn't allowed to go in, obviously. So that's a different country. All the way up into Syria in verse 24, and people coming from there. And then in verse 25, great crowds following him from Galilee, the Decapolis. That's southeast of the Sea of Galilee. Jerusalem, Judea. You see the all-encompassing ness of what's going on here? It's going. It's, it's spreading from beyond the Jordan. It demonstrates the comprehensiveness of his establishment of his kingdom. And, and you and I see the results of that and experience the results of that now, do we not? His kingdom is present and growing right here in our hearts. And it's present and growing in Spain with the Bayless's ministry and in Finland with the Wilhelmsons and in Ukraine with the Gustafsons and in Nepal with the Galais. And all of the others who are taking this light of the kingdom and going into the darkness. And that darkness cannot, cannot overtake or provide enough obstacles where the light will not shine into the darkest corners until finally the realities of this kingdom will be finalized. Don't forget, too, that though Matthew has redemptive and kingdom purposes here, and so I think there's a purposefulness to like this initial explosion of the healings. What's happening is Matthew is saying the king has come and he's reversing the curse. Now, you and I know that it's not finally reversed yet, right? Because you still do get cancer. You still do get a thousand other things, sore backs and muscles and headaches, and marital strife, and even divorce, and death. It's not finalized, but Jesus is demonstrating the fact that the king reverses the curse. But though that is what Matthew is trying to portray here as to what it means that God's kingdom is being established and the curse is being reversed, there's the simple fact that this demonstrates God's love and compassion and miraculous power, which we experience. I don't want you to miss this. This is, this is demonstrative of God Himself walking among hurting people and loving them, which is what He does for us. Now, God may not have fixed your physical malady. But the reality here, what Jesus is showing us is that this is the way He feels about His brothers and sisters who are all with Him, children of God. This is the way God loves you as one of His sons and daughters. And again, I will, I will plead with you, if you have not been brought into what it means to be a son or a daughter who's dearly loved by this Savior, would today you repent of your sins and put your faith in Him and find what it means to be loved by this kind of God? And I also need to say that, that Jesus still does do this. That's why we pray. Jesus still miraculously heals. And some of you have even seen the evidence 
of that. But I want you to especially think about this as you're, as you're picturing Jesus like healing a paralytic or casting out a demon or making someone who was blind being able to see all of the specific things that are mentioned here. Various diseases and pains, epileptics, paralytics, oppressed by demons. There should be a content discontentment in us as we realize that he has, he has done this fundamentally to us as He's removed the darkness and He's healed our most fundamental need. But then as we have headaches, as we can't get out of bed because our back's killing us, as we get all kinds of sicknesses, as we struggle through relationships, as we face death, both for others and ourselves, as we face uncertainty, the King who showed it here will one day eradicate every effect of the curse. And you and I, though we are participating in the kingdom now, will participate in His kingdom that He's previewing here. And as the song says, what a day that will be. In the beginning, mankind rebelled against God and His goodness and His provision and fell into slavery of sin and darkness and every result of the curse in pain and sorrow. You know that, don't you? But here, a light has dawned. God has come to man. The culmination of all that He's been doing eternally and since the fall to bring us back to Him to take us out of darkness into light, to welcome us into His kingdom through repentance, to convince us of the surpassing worth of Jesus so we follow Him and proclaim His kingdom and abandon everything else, and to initially, and then one day, make all things new. And let us this morning rejoice in and worship and follow that King. Let's pray. Would you give us, as we often pray, Father, greater capacities through your Spirit to see the value of your Son, to see how He has indeed brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into His marvelous light, how you have granted repentance through your Spirit, and through repentance we participate in your kingdom, and what it means really to see His value and abandon everything else and follow Him, and then to experience fundamentally in our souls, and even now sometimes physically, and one day finally physically, the fact that He has made, is making, and will make all things new. In His name, amen. I believe that an appropriate way for us to <clears throat> close our uh, time of preaching as we move into communion is to just simply say to Jesus that we love Him. So let's stand together. We're going to sing this hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee, and then we will begin our time of communion. Sing together.
sing the last verse uh, after communion, but you can go ahead and be seated. And again, if you have not gotten the elements, I uh, invite you to go out the side aisles here and grab both the crackers and the uh, cup. I'm going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for our, our, our text where we'll be today for the Lord's Supper. You don't have to turn there. Um, you can if you'd like. I'm so grateful that once a month for Jesus, um, through Paul actually in 1 Corinthians 11, talks about as often as you take the Lord's Supper. And so there's some latitude as to how we would do it. If the church does it every week, that fits with what Scripture says. If the church does it once a quarter, it fits with what Scripture says. If the church does it once a month, like we do, it fits with what Scripture says. But I am very grateful that as we come together as sons and daughters who have a transcendent bond, despite your interests, your disagreements on someone about with some, another believer about something, we have a transcendent bond because we have been made right with God through faith in Jesus and what He's done in His life and death and resurrection, bearing God's punishment on our behalf so that by faith we can made, be made righteous as we repent of our sins. I'm so grateful that we can come and remember, but then also celebrate. And so... There's an interesting tension when we come together. There's a sobriety, but there should be unrestrained joy. Because what you and I are participating in as we eat a cracker and as we drink grape juice, we are, we are showing that we, have, we are participating in something infinitely deeper. That Jesus' body was crushed by the Father. He bore all of the sins of God's people for all of history in His body as the Father poured His cup of wrath on Him and His body was broken so that yours won't be forever. And the precious pure blood of Jesus was shed, was spilled. The only person ever divine and human, the only person ever who didn't deserve to have His blood shed in punishment, obeyed His Father to the end, so that again, as we're thinking about metaphorical and you know, spiritual things, thinking of it this way, God will not shed your blood forever. And you are covered, and you are made white as snow. Now, I do want to say before we read the text, that we believe that Scripture teaches us that communion is for those who have experienced the reality of what it means to put your faith in Jesus alone and be made righteous. We don't require baptism, though I believe that baptism is an expression of obedience. We don't require you to be members of our church, but we are dogmatic about the fact that I believe that the Bible teaches this is, what it, this is showing something that has happened to you that you've participated in all of the realities of Jesus' broken body and shed blood. This is also a time where you need to be examining your hearts. I think I forgot in our pastoral prayer this morning, confession, which I typically don't forget. But usually on Sundays we give you a chance to confess sin early on in the service. But this is an opportunity to, to go to God and say, I confess those sins that I've committed this week where I've not loved you like I should. I've loved so many other things more than I've loved you. And I've not loved my neighbor as myself. And there are things I've done that I shouldn't have and things that I didn't do that I should have. So I confess those sins and I want to be right with you as I'm entering this, again, joyful yet also sober time. With all of that in mind, let me read the passage and then we will take the elements together. Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when He was betrayed took bread... 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we will follow exactly what the Scripture says. Jesus took the, the bread and then um, He had given thanks. And so let us do that together. Jesus, I thank You that Your body was broken. We have no comprehension of both the physical aspect, but also more than that, what it means that your Father crushed you and poured His wrath on you instead of us. But all we can do is, with as much as is in our hearts, just say thank you. As I'm reminded of the song that we were once your enemies, now we're seated at your table. We once were children of darkness, now we're children of light. And so thank you. Before we do eat the bread, I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, that what you're holding in your hands is a reminder that the one who was not affected by the curse, who healed all who were affected by the curse, took on the results of the curse so that one day you and I will finally live back in God's design, God and mankind with no results of the curse together forever. And so this bite says that to you. So eat it joyfully. If you've trusted Christ, you are united to Him and you have participated in what it means that His body was broken and that He was raised and you now, in your union with Him, walk in, in newness of life. And then, the text says in verse 25, in the same way, He took the cup. After supper, obviously, we know that this, this was part of the Passover meal as Jesus is initiating the new covenant celebration in the Lord's Supper. And He says, this cup is the new covenant in My blood. And then he says, do, all, do this as often as you drink it. And we think that obviously it says in the same way. So he prayed for that too. So let's ask God's, thank God and then ask His blessing on this cup. And then I'll give you another little statement before we drink. I thank you again, Father. We never get tired of saying this, that your son's blood was shed. Uh, something infinitely more significant than just a physical death so that you will not punish us forever. And we are eternally grateful. And so, brothers and sisters, what I want to say to you today as I hold this cup in my hand is that this cup reminds you that you have been brought into the kingdom of light because of the blood that was shed on your behalf. We sing a song that says His blood, not physically, but metaphorically, flows through our veins. We are His. We are united to Him. And now we are children of light. And so therefore, in that we have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness and we are children of light, let us again drink this drink with joy and gratitude. <clears throat> I'd like to invite our worship team to come back up. As you know, I love the last verses of the Lord's Supper texts. Because Paul says here, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, which is what we do. We're always caring about in the body the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is precious to us. You proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And one day, you and I will not eat a cracker and drink grape juice with a headache. We will not eat a cracker and drink grape juice with difficulty with another Christian or a non-believer because we will participate with Jesus in an eternal celebration and the curse will be reversed. So 
We're going to sing that last verse of my Jesus, I love thee. So let's stand together and this talks about that in mansions of glory, all right? Give us that starting note, please. In mansions of glory. Two things. Uh, graduates, why don't you head to my office so I can get a picture of you. And then uh, we want to make sure that we greet Jamie. And I assume this is your husband, right? Okay. Never met you, but uh, make sure that you catch them and say hi to them. We're grateful you guys could be with us. And you are dismissed.